In the Richmond, Virginia area exists a dark memory of what can only be described as a week of domestic terrorism. A stark contrast to the friendly and welcoming nature of the community. So when the Harvey family was discovered annihilated with their house burning down, it shook Richmond to its core. And when just five days later the Baskerville Tucker family were also discovered annihilated, an important link would be made, which raised the question, how secure are you in your own house? However, unbeknownst to the Harveys or the Baskerville Tuckers, they would answer this question with their lives. You see, the Harveys were preparing a celebration that morning, January 1st, 2006. They had a tradition of hosting a party every New Year's Day. A usual get-together hosted by them and attended by their wide circle of friends. It was these types of expressions that made the Harveys so popular in the community. Everyone felt they cared. With everything set in motion, a sense of peace occupied the Harvey household. They were making final preparations to kick off the new year with a bang. At least, that was the plan. And in common fashion, they left their doors open for all the guests soon to arrive. But within a matter of short moments, this decision would prove fatal. The Harveys were beloved in the community of Richmond. They lived there all their life and contributed to it in their own way. Brian Harvey was a talented and well-known local musician who played in a series of local bands. He was most well-known as the front man for the two-man band called House of Freaks. Catherine Harvey was a successful entrepreneur who co-owned a bustling novelty shop in the heart of Richmond called World of Mirth, where all things unique were available at a modest price. The two would eventually meet and have two beautiful daughters, Stella and Ruby Harvey who, by all accounts, were spitting images of their beloved parents. Those are just some of the things people remember about the Harveys. And some of the last sightings of the Harveys would include them doing what they loved most. One close friend distinctly remembers the final time she spoke to any of the Harveys. And if she knew what she knew now, she would have been terrified upon their final encounter. She could have died with them upon their final encounter. That morning around 10 a.m., Kirsten Perkison would drive to the Harvey household located at 812 West 31st Street, Richmond, Virginia, to drop off Stella. She had her own daughter with her and was planning on having her stay at the Harveys for a play date. The young girls were best friends after all, so nothing out of the ordinary here. What was out of the ordinary was how Catherine Harvey answered the door to greet her best friend. She looked uneasy and stressed, or was it anxious and depressed? Take your pick. But Catherine just didn't seem okay, and it wouldn't be until hours later that Kirsten found out why. In Kirsten's own words, Catherine looked pale and ashen. Regardless, little Stella made her way to their basement. The Perkinson daughter followed suit, but was blocked by Catherine. At this moment, Kirsten asked her friend if everything was alright, to which Catherine would respond in a manner that may or may not have been a sign for help. She held her hand like a gun, put it to the side of her head, and moved it in a circular motion. Unsure of what to make of this, Kirsten chalked it up to the stresses of life and took it as a hint to give Catherine the time she needed to feel better. And so, inadvertently avoiding death and with a final goodbye, this was the last time Kirsten Perkinson would see any of the Harveys. Because within the depths of the Harvey basement were Ray Dandridge and Ricky Gray, two outsiders to not only the family, but the community as a whole, who were only there for an opportune moment to rob a home. And with an open front door, they walked in. Ricky Javon Gray and Ray Joseph Dandridge. Two names well known to the Richmond area, all for the wrong reasons. This uncle-nephew duo, respectively, were both 28 years old and both ruthless thugs. And for the better part of 10 years, the pair had spent most of their time in prison. 
but mostly for small robberies and drugs. Whether their first, second, or third time, their most recent release from prison would be in 2005, after serving 10 years for armed robbery. Ricky Gray would be the first released from the most recent sentence, and in October of that same year, Ray Dandridge walked out as well. Almost immediately, Dandridge sought out his uncle, who was residing in Washington, Pennsylvania with his then-alive wife, Trava Gray, and who both lived in Trava's mother's house, although Trava wouldn't be alive for much longer because she was later found dead in early November of that year. Initially concluded to be a drug overdose, Trava's mom had her doubts and evicted Gray and Dandridge from her home. The pair then decided to go their separate ways, just to meet back up a month later on Christmas Eve. For all their life, they've stolen their keep. That's all they knew. And so their meetups were never of any productive means. No. They revolved around predation and opportunistic activities. They didn't care about the pain they inflicted, so much as they cared for the potential gain in it for them. Picture this. You just got home and exited your vehicle. You lock it up and make your way towards your front door. When out of the shadows, you get punched in the head by a hulking thug. Okay. Robbery. You think. You immediately give up your wallet and car keys. But instead of just losing your physical possessions, you almost lose your life. Because there isn't just one thug, but two. And they're both savagely stabbing you for God knows what reason. This is the act of attempted murder 26-year-old Ryan Carey underwent on New Year's Eve 2005. He was so brutally attacked that two knives broke off in his body. He was so brutally attacked that he fell into a coma for two weeks. He was so brutally attacked that he lost the use of his right arm. Carey would later testify that I felt knives going into the bottom of my mouth. But time stopped for no man, and both thugs made their way to Richmond, Virginia to continue their brutality. Whether they spent the previous night plotting or simply existing as two pieces of waste, Gray and Dandridge made their way to the Harvey's neighborhood by 9 a.m. the next morning, New Year's Day. Driving around in Gray's van, he, Dandridge, and Dandridge's girlfriend Ashley Baskerville Tucker spotted Harvey's open door, and using Ashley as a lookout, they quickly made their way inside. As soon as Gray and Dandridge walked into the Harvey home, they herded the family like sheep to the basement, restraining them with packing tape and extension cords. The basement was Harvey's entertainment room, loving family memories now invaded by two towering assailants. Gray led the assault, and Dandridge followed his uncle closely. Gray rambled something about let us get what we want, and no one gets hurt. A small glimmer of hope. Brian, the patriarch, helpless against overwhelming force, began conversing with the two thugs in an attempt to de-escalate the situation. According to reports, Brian persuaded the assailants to at least untie Catherine and the girls, and they obliged. According to Dandridge, his uncle Ricky seemed extraordinarily enraged eyes almost bulging out of his head. All the while, Catherine attempted to calm her terrified daughters. At that moment, no one knew, but Gray was high on PCP. PCP is known to cause auditory and visual hallucinations and violent behavior. He was a keg ready to blow, which was only exacerbated by the Harvey sisters' fear and inability to sit still. And then he snapped. He started with Kathy Harvey, and while her daughter, Ruby Harvey, sat in her lap, slashed her throat from behind. Ruby panicked at the sight of her beloved mother in the state she was in, and in a deranged state himself, Gray stabs her as well. And as Stella Harvey came running to aid her wounded sister, Ricky again committed vile brutality and stabbed her too. Both sisters were now grievously wounded, and later autopsies indicated that their wounds were so deep it pierced their little lungs. Miraculously, they were still alive, but in agony and writhing in pain, trying to wrap their innocent minds around these unmeasurably evil circumstances. 
Gray didn't like this, so he demanded his nephew, Dandridge, start bashing them with a hammer to quiet them for good. To which Dandridge refused. For a fraction of a second, Dandridge showed a sliver of morality, quickly undone, as he bashed Catherine's head in instead. And so Gray decided to do it himself and began to bludgeon the girls. Finally, he moved on to Brian Harvey. One can only imagine the thoughts flooding through the family in their final moments. In stark contrast to a laptop, some random items, and a plate of cookies, the lives lost were priceless. Gray then proceeded to start a fire in the basement using wine as an accelerant. They quickly ran out and sped away in Ricky Gray's van. It was now 1.30 p.m. No one had yet to realize what happened, and so the party guests started arriving. The first was Brian's old bandmate, a man named Hot. He had brought along his own daughter and was excited to catch up. Upon his arrival, he made his way towards the basement. The front door was still unlocked, as it often was during Harvey parties. As he saw the thick cloud of billowing smoke, he ran out and quickly told a neighbor to call 911. Firefighters arrived promptly and upon entering the premises and seizing the fire, they discovered the remains of the Harvey family. Devastation quickly turned to horror upon revelation of how they really died. It was now a murder investigation. Investigators at the scene were not only distraught, they were confused. What happened? From all witness testimonies, the Harveys had no enemies. They weren't involved in shady dealings. They were by all accounts loved and respected, which means that the person responsible was evil incarnate, deranged in the head and extremely dangerous. A predator was on the loose, and the clock was ticking. Who knows how many more victims would suffer the same fate. But investigators were stumped. They were following all leads and couldn't track down any possible suspects. For six days, there was no connection between Ricky, Ray, and the Harvey slayings. However, that all changed on January 6th, 2006, when a woman by the name of Latoya Pauly called in to report the potential homicide of her friend, Ashley Baskerville Tucker. The same Ashley that functioned as a lookout during the Harvey massacre. She informed them that both Gray and Dandridge had recently stopped by her house with a laptop. On it was a picture of the Harveys as its wallpaper. The Harvey case was heavily covered on the news, and it was unmistakable. This belonged to them. As well, she gave details about a plan concocted by Ashley, Gray, and Dandridge to rob Ashley's parents, where Ashley would play hostage to Ricky and Ray to extort money from the Baskerville Tuckers. Although Latoya heard everything and was offered a role in it, she didn't oblige, but instead became wary of the trio. Hours later, only the uncle and nephew returned. With only the words, she went bye-bye as the explanation for Ashley's absence. This was the lead investigators needed to start connecting dots. LaToya told investigators where Ashley lived, East Broad Rock Road in South Richmond, and there would be another grisly scene. 55-year-old Percy L. Tucker, 46-year-old Mary Baskerville Tucker, and 21-year-old Ashley Baskerville Tucker were found tied up, gagged, and their throats were slit. Tape was covering the heads of Percy L and Mary, while Ashley had a plastic bag over her head. It was discovered that the cause of death was suffocation and torture. The Baskerville Tuckers were annihilated. Two whole families murdered within a span of less than a week? Was there a connection? And if so, what? Just like the Harveys, both Percy L and Mary Tucker didn't have enemies. They lived quiet lives. Perciel was a forklift operator and Mary worked for a housekeeping business. Both were caught in the betrayal of their daughter. She was the ultimate undoing of an innocent couple just looking to live out their golden years. It didn't take long to discover the one link the Harveys and Tuckers had with one another. Ashley had died wearing Brian Harvey's wedding band. They had to act fast if they wanted to catch Gray and Dandridge before they caused any more irreparable damage. They enlisted the help of Latoya and had her call to probe at Dandridge on Ashley's whereabouts. 
to which Dandridge revealed that Ashley is no longer a problem. And they drove to his dad's place in the Tucker vehicle. Although he wouldn't reveal the address, authorities would trace the call to his exact location, a house on North Wanamaker Street, Philadelphia. Officials had to move fast. On the morning of January 7th, 2006, the authorities arrive at the premises and immediately spot the Baskerville Tucker vehicle parked out front. Knowing the degree of threat these suspects pose, they call in the SWAT team for a tactical extraction. After acquiring a search warrant, they storm the residence. They quickly make their way through the home and spot Dandridge running towards them, attempting to escape. He's quickly apprehended. As they make their way further into the home, they discover Gray hiding behind a water heater and he pretends to have a gun in his hand and smirks as if it's all a game. They force him out by bashing him over the head with the butt of their gun, to which Gray responds with cowardly surrender. The domestic terror has finally come to an end. As the news percolates through the police department, they celebrate the prevention of any more destruction of life. Dandridge would be the first to strike a deal with officials to give a written statement of the crimes the duo had committed. He gave an account with all the horrifying details, how they killed the Harveys, how Ashley was an accomplice, how they also killed the Tuckers, but that he wasn't responsible for the Harvey sister killings. And that was all his uncle Ricky Gray. This would spare him the death penalty. He even revealed that Ricky was responsible for the death of his wife, Trava Gray, almost two months back. Unfortunately for Ricky, his days would be numbered. As soon as he found out that his nephew confessed, he decided to do so as well. And he too went into grisly detail of both family slayings. It was nothing personal, they just needed money. And so his low IQ brain could muster but one solution, bestially depraved plundering. In other words, kill and take. All the while he held a dead, cold stare. In fact, Gray was so indifferent about the lives he took that investigators truly believed they were looking at evil incarnate. Their commencing trials were just and swift. Only a month apart, Ricky Gray was up first. He gave an account of continual sexual assault as a growing boy by none other than his own half-brother, as well as frequent beatings from his father ever growing worse as he teetered the brink of childhood and loss of innocence. Eventually, by 11 years old, Gray had been an alcoholic for two years and was addicted to PCP. While this is its own form of hellish existence, nothing dissuaded the jury, especially the recounting of how little Ruby and Stella Harvey died, and he was convicted for five counts of capital murder, sentencing him to death. Ray Dandridge would be spared the death penalty for his confession and pleading guilty to the charges against him. He was sentenced to life in prison where he remains today. Ricky Gray was executed on January 18th, 2017. The horrific events that plague Richmond, Virginia for a week straight are remembered as the 2006 Richmond slayings. The lives it claimed will be remembered in the way they need to be, as the people they were. The Harveys were dedicated a bridge at the Forest Hill Park. There stands a two-ton monument, a self-portrait in bronze as the centerpiece with an included scripture that memorializes and immortalizes a family that brought so much joy for the entirety of their existence. As well, the Baskerville Tuckers, who like most of us, just wanted to live a life they wanted but were caught under the weight of a loved one's underpinnings. Rest in peace, Harvey and Baskerville Tucker families. The losses were too great a lesson to learn, but we will learn from this tragedy. We can take away from all of this that we must always make sure to be as prepared as we can be, because evil does exist and it can happen to anyone. And if you're ever in a life or death situation, you must always fight for your life as best you can. With that being said, I appreciate every one of you. I've been spending more time with the video creation process in an effort to increase quality. 
As I progress, the process will fast track, but as it stands, I'm aiming for one video every three to four days. I appreciate all the comments, so keep those up. As well, if you enjoy the content, consider a like and subscribe, as there's more good stuff to come. With that being said, take care and until next time.